Scripture means when it talks about turning a person over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh? You know, there is an answer to this, and it applies directly to letting God's kind of love flow through you to a person who's offended you. Stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a teaching that I've entitled God's Kind of Love Through You to Other People. And we've been talking about how to reconcile differences, how to get along with people. We're now in our sixth part of a nine-part teaching that this album covers. And this one is dealing with offenses when all else fails. We've already been talking about if you are the problem, how you deal with that. If the other person is the problem, I started reading last week out of Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus gave us four or five steps, depending on how you interpret this. Uh, he gave us these steps that you use when dealing with a person who's offended you. And we've already talked about the first two. The first step, according to Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 15, Jesus said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So these are the first two steps. We've already covered this about you, you always go to the person first. You talk to them before you ever talk about them to anyone else. Then you take a few more with you for the purpose of arbitration to get this uh, outsider's uh, perspective, an independent perspective, one that's not uh, covered with hurt and emotions. And uh, so we've already talked about those first two steps. If you take these steps and you still haven't been able to reconcile with this person, Jesus goes on and tells us the next steps to take. In verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, this is when you take one or two more with you, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So now this is really important. And let me just say a couple of things before we get into the practical application of how you walk these steps out. Steps number three and step number four, where you take this dispute before the church, and then if he refuses to hear the judgment of the church, then you uh, let him be to you as a heathen and a publican. Those two steps, steps three and four, um, I don't know how to say this. It doesn't really apply to us today the way that it did in Bible times and the way that I believe that God would want it to apply. Now, I know that somebody is just immediately offended and saying, so you're thinking that, you know, the Word of God is outdated or it doesn't work or it doesn't apply. No, that's not what I'm saying. But see, th these steps, three and four, are basically talking about a disfellowshipping of a person if they won't submit to the judgment of the church. And uh, there's a number of things that won't make this work today. Number one, you can't even find very many churches. Matter of fact, I honestly can only think of one or two churches that I'm associated with that would take this kind of responsibility of resolving differences between members in the church. And so, since the church hasn't accepted this responsibility, well, then what do you do? Say you're trying to implement and follow Jesus' instructions and so you've gone to the person individually and that didn't solve it. You take one or two more and that didn't solve the situation. Well, how are you going to bring them in front of the church and have the church get involved and try and resolve this dispute if a church won't accept that kind of responsibility? I believe that we're supposed to. That's what the Lord said that the church was supposed to be doing these kind of things. But you know what? It doesn't function this way in most churches today. Most churches don't do this. If you were to have a dispute with somebody, and if you followed step one and two, went to them, took one or two more, and then if you came to the pastor of the church and said, I'd like you to get involved and uh, help me to reconcile this situation, you know what most pastors would say? Well, have you taken them to small claims court? Have you uh, consulted a lawyer? 
have you, and they would look for something else. The church, by and large, has advocated this responsibility, and they don't accept responsibility for resolving disputes. And so since the church isn't functioning this way, this option isn't available to every single person. Uh, somebody might say, well, then why even go through this? Well, I think that the principle uh, is worth uh, showing us. And if you can get a church to submit and take this kind of a responsibility, it would be a wonderful thing. Also, here's another problem with following these steps. If your dispute is with a non-believer, then you know what? If you wanted to take it before the church and have the church get involved, if you could find a church that would accept this responsibility and take this position of arbitrating between you and another person, even if you found a church that would accept that responsibility, if you're dealing with an unbeliever, probably the unbeliever would say, I don't care what the church says. It's not going to be binding to me. I don't have any respect or any commitment to the church. And so therefore, steps three and four would cease to have any power because the person that you have uh, a difference with wouldn't submit to it. So those are two reasons right there why this probably wouldn't work. I can give you some more. And one of them is that because the body of Christ is not unified today, if you were to implement steps three and four that the Lord listed right here in Matthew chapter 18, and if you were to disfellowship a person and withdraw your fellowship from them, because the way the body of Christ is fragmented, we have so many different denominations, so many different groups, like right here in Colorado Springs, this is a city of less than 500,000 people. I don't know the exact population, but around 400,000 or something like that. And I bet you we easily, easily have 450 or 500 churches. And, and most of those churches aren't in fellowship with each other. Even many of the churches that are of the same denomination don't have any fellowship with another church in the same denomination. So if you were to try and implement these steps and put this into practice, all a person would have to do, if you cut off their fellowship from, from one church, they just go across the street to the next church and get plugged in there. And so it has a very minimal impact on people because of the division and schism in the body of Christ today. So am I saying that the Word of God doesn't apply? No, it still applies. This is still the very best way to deal with problems and disputes. And I think that there's things that we can glean from this and apply to our individual situation. But I'm just saying up front that as we go through step three and four, you need to recognize that sometimes you can't implement this because the body of Christ is not accepting this responsibility. And even if an individual church accepted this, the fragmentation in the body of Christ would minimize the impact that this kind of church judgment would have on any individual. So it's important for you to recognize this. You're going to have to interpret this and apply it uh, in a way that will fit the situation that we live in today. But there's basically four steps given right here. The first two about going and talking directly to the individual, talking to them before you talk about them, that definitely applies. Major, major thing that would stop a lot of problems. And then if that doesn't work, going with arbitration, taking a couple of more people who will have an objective uh, perspective on this thing for the purpose of reconciling you two. Those two are just absolutely essential and would deal with the vast majority of cases. But if the person doesn't respond when you take those first two steps, here is the third step that the Lord told us to do in verse 17. If he shall neglect to hear them, talking about these one or two more, tell it unto the church. In other words, bring this problem before the body of believers. And again, I need to point out some of these things, that in the first century church, and of course when Jesus was speaking this, there was such a unity, there was such a oneness among the believers. You know, for instance, all of the synagogues that met before Jesus rose from the dead and before the Christian church was actually implemented at the exact time that Jesus spoke this, all of the synagogues recognized one central leadership, the high priest 
and the uh, council and all of these people, all of these synagogues were under one authority. They were united. Now, I'm sure that there was differences among them, the same that there is among people anytime, anywhere. But nonetheless, even with their differences, they were one unit, they were one body, and if you would have disfellowshipped a person from the synagogue of Jesus' day, I guarantee you it would have taken throughout all of the synagogues. You would have been basically shut out from the Jewish religion. And then in the first century church, after the church came into being, the church was one church. There weren't multiple churches in one place. You know, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Corinth. There weren't many churches. There was one church. And yet the church in Ephesus, according to some of the historical documents that I've read, uh, people believe that there was a minimum of 50,000 and possibly as many as 100,000 believers in the church at Ephesus when uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, the first bishop of the church at Ephesus. And they didn't have one central building. Christian churches didn't begin until about the 4th century uh, A.D., and prior to that time, they were meeting in homes and wherever they could find. So if there was 50,000 or 100,000 believers, you know that you couldn't fit all of those in one person's house. They meant in many different locations. There could have been a 1,000 different house churches around Ephesus, and yet they all were one body under one leadership. And because of that unity... If that church group was to exercise this church discipline upon an individual, it would have been a very, very severe discipline. That same thing doesn't apply today with all of the schism that we see in the body of Christ. But there still is a principle here, and we're going to continue to talk about that. Andrew's nine-part teaching titled, God's Kind of Love Through You, is available on CD for a gift of 30 pounds or more. The sixth individual CD in the album is available for a donation of three pounds. But to those unable to send a gift, Andrew and his partners will provide this sixth teaching free of charge. Or you can receive the full album as part of the God's Kind of Love five pack for a gift of 60 pounds or more. The five pack includes God's Kind of Love Through You, God's Kind of Love To You, and God's Kind of Love, The Cure for What Ails You. Two companion books complete the five-pack, The True Nature of God and Spirit, Soul, and Body. Request the God's Kind of Love five-pack when you write, call, or go to our website. We hope to hear from you today. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So we were talking about how to deal with an offense that someone else has given you. And uh, if it's not you that's the problem, if the other person is the problem, how do you deal with it? Jesus said, first of all, go directly to them before you talk to anybody else. Secondly, you take one or two more with you. Now we're talking about the third step. And as I've said before the break, uh, this has to be interpreted somewhat today because the church is not in unity and the church is not taking the responsibility that the scripture here gives the church and so there isn't going to be an ability to just implement this across the board. But this third step is that if you've gone to him personally, and if that didn't work, if you took arbitration and that didn't work, well then basically you bring them before the entire church and let the church hear what the dispute is. And the church passes a judgment in this situation. Of course, this would be under the influence of a godly leader like a pastor and this godly leader and the church, maybe not just the pastor, but the leadership, the wise men in the church would give their opinion on who's right, who's wrong, what the outcome should be. And the ideal thing is that the two parties that are opposed to each other submit to the judgment of the church. Now this is a big if. And as I said, most churches won't even accept this responsibility. If they did accept it, it would have limited input uh, because the person who was, uh, had the church uh, judge against them and say, you're wrong, all they'd have to do is pack up and walk across the street to another church and they could begin to start receiving all of the benefits and pleasures of being associated with a body of believers. And so it can't be implemented exactly, but I think that the principle is still worth noting and applying. Like say for instance, let's say that you 
and one of your relatives uh, are having a problem and you've got a problem, uh, some strife or something going on. Well, I think that we ought to implement these same steps. You go directly to them and you try and reconcile. Let's say that it was a, let's just pick this out, that it's a brother or a sister that you have some kind of a, I'm talking about a physical brother or sister that you have some kind of contention with. The proper thing to do would be to go directly to them. Don't talk to other family members. Don't talk to friends or anybody else. Go directly to them and try and reconcile this situation. I believe in the majority of cases that would probably deal with it. But if that doesn't work, then you might talk to another family member or possibly if you have a mutual friend, you could go to them. And the purpose of this is that arbitration, this third person perspective. But if that doesn't work, even though the church may not accept this kind of a responsibility for trying to bring harmony and, and reconcile a difference, what you could do is go to your parents. You could go to the authority figure that's in the home. And again, you know, it's not a perfect application because today most people don't even respect their parents. They wouldn't honor their parents more than they would honor their own opinion or whatever. So this this uh, comparison begins to break down if people aren't uh, functioning normally the way that God made them to. But let's just say that you had tried to reconcile with your brother or sister. You had been to them. You would taken one or two more. But if that doesn't work, if you could take it before, say, a family council, take it before the leadership, your parents or whatever, and if you would just submit this situation and say, we want to reconcile, what should we do? then you, if the family would accept this kind of responsibility for getting involved in the dispute and then pass a decision, hopefully that would bring enough um, pressure on the person who is wrong that when all of these people have stood in line and said, you know what, you're wrong, you need to operate in forgiveness, you need to change, you need to do this or this or this or whatever it is, hopefully that there is such a desire to keep the family unit intact and to walk in love with each other, that that would cause the person who's wrong to humble themselves and to change. So you could still apply this same logic, the same principle. You just have to interpret it according to the situation that we live in today. And of course, if that doesn't work, then what do you do? Well, the next step it says here, step number four is, if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation. Some people have taken this to say that this means that you just hate the guy. You totally reject them and you'll, you break off everything and you just treat them badly. Let me ask you this. Should a Christian treat a heathen uh, terribly? Should you hate them? Certainly not. Jesus said that you're supposed to love your enemies, that you're supposed to bless those who curse you and be kind to those who've despitefully used you. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. This is not talking about uh, an excuse to treat a person unkind and to treat a person in a non-Christian way. Now, I need to say that because this has been interpreted. This is, leaves uh, open for some uh, interpretation right here. And some people have uh, made this a very harsh thing. As a matter of fact, let me turn over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, it is reported commonly. That means that this has already been established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. They had already been through a few of these steps to where now this was public knowledge. This isn't just hearsay or an impression or an opinion that may be, uh, you know, incorrect. This was common knowledge. Everybody acknowledged this that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. In other words, Paul is scolding this group of Christians and saying that there is fornication among you that even the unbelievers don't live like this. You're supposed to be Christians, little Christ. You are supposed to be representing God and yet you've got greater immorality functioning among your body of believers than the Gentiles. Even unbelievers don't do this kind of stuff to where they commit sexual incest with a stepmother. He was just appalled that they had allowed this to go on. And in verse 2 it says, And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. 
For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is a strong statement. I'm sure that many of you have heard uh, this passage of Scripture, whether you've studied it or been familiar with it. You've probably heard about turning a person over to Satan. And again, just like the passage that Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter 18, this has been interpreted so harshly that sometimes people have interpreted this as what you're doing is basically just damning this person to hell. You're taking their salvation away from them because they had done something wrong. That's not what this is. This is not talking about sending a person to hell. As a matter of fact, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, remember that this is a letter written to the same group of people that he had written about this uh, incest and the judgment of turning this person over to Satan. So here he is talking about this same situation in the next letter that he wrote to him. And in verse 4, he says, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he had not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love towards him. Now here he is talking about this man who had committed incest and that he had instructed the believers to turn him over to Satan. And here he is saying, now this man has suffered enough. Confirm your love. Receive him back into fellowship so that he won't be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So the very um, fact that they forgave this man and were instructed by the apostle Paul to forgive him and accept him back into the fellowship of the believers shows that this did not take his salvation away from him. You know, I hate to even mention this, but some people think, well, maybe they uh, took his salvation away and now he prayed and got born again again. No, over in Hebrews chapter 6, if a person ever falls away, it's impossible to renew them under repentance. You don't get save loss, save loss, save loss. That's not a scriptural concept. And so this shows you that when they turned this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, it was not taking his salvation away from him. That's not what it is. And I'm out of time today, so I can't tell you what it is. On today's program, I'm going to have to save this for our broadcast tomorrow. I encourage you to join me then because this is something that will help clarify some scriptures and it will also help you in your dealings with other people when a person has hardened himself and will not repent. So please listen as our announcer gives you some information about how you get these materials. This could be a tremendous help to you. So please call or write today and then make sure you join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's nine-part teaching titled God's Kind of Love Through You is available on CD for a gift of 30 pounds or more. The sixth individual CD in the album is available for a donation of three pounds. But to those unable to send a gift, Andrew and his partners will provide this sixth teaching free of charge. Or you can receive the full album as part of the God's Kind of Love five pack for a gift of 60 pounds or more. The five pack includes God's kind of love through you, God's kind of love to you, and God's kind of love, the cure for what ails you. Two companion books complete the five pack, The True Nature of God and Spirit, Soul, and Body. Request the God's kind of love five pack when you write, call, or go to our website. We hope to hear from you today. I want to thank those of you who've become partners with the gospel truth and are helping us take these truths around the world. We now have over 160 million households outside of the United States who get this program on a daily basis. And we have around 66 million households in the United States. Or it's about 60% of the households in the United States. But there is so much more that I would like to do. 
If you haven't yet become a partner with us, if you've received these truths, and if it's blessing you and you'd like to see someone else blessed, then please call that number that you see on your screen and please become a Gospel Truth partner with us today. I'd like to encourage you to come join me at one of our Gospel Truth seminars that we hold around the United States. These are three-day meetings where I minister five times from Thursday night to Saturday night with uh, Friday and Saturday morning sessions, and I just teach from the Word of God. We have Bible college students, prayer ministers that travel with us, and we see awesome miracles. Just this last time, we saw people come out of wheelchairs. We saw tumors instantly dissolve and leave. And great things are happening at these Gospel Truth Seminars. So we're coming to a city near you. I'd like to encourage you to go to the effort, make plans to join us. We have hotels that you can register right online. So check it out, our Gospel Truth Seminar. I know that many of you have been stirred up by the things that I shared on our program today. And maybe you're considering uh, some of this tough love and wondering what you should do. You know, I encourage you to get these materials, but when you call to get them also, you could get the people that are answering the phone to pray with you. And I tell you, we have some very mature Christians that have been through some of the exact same things that you're going through, and I think that they could be a help to you. So we have that number on the screen in front of you. I encourage you to call and not only request the products that we're offering, but also get prayer. Let someone pray with you, and I believe that God will give you wisdom and show you what to do in your exact situation. You know, I'm offering this God's Kind of Love 5-pack that will give you a lot more information on this subject of love. But really, one of the best resources that I have is our website. We have about 400 of my teachings that are available as free downloads on this website. I also have about seven years worth of my television programs, about 10 years worth of our radio programs. We have books, we have articles that I've written. All of these things are available free of charge. It's a tremendous resource material. So we have that address on your screen. Please join us at awme.net. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth. We realize that this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 5 was talking about when they turned a person over to Satan. It didn't mean that you are taking away their salvation or doing something terrible, but you just are quitting uh, your intercession that has been holding Satan at bay, and you let that person reap what they sow with the hope that maybe when they start seeing that, man, everything in their life is going wrong, that it would make them realize this is the wrong way to be living. They'd repent and they'd come back to relationship with God. So when we saw that that was what was happening, we prayed about it. And finally, as a body of believers, we talked about this and we said, we love Andy. We pray that he responds, but we're going to quit praying for him and interceding and binding the devil off of him because he's taking our intercession as basically a, a way to continue living in sin. There's something that happens in the spirit realm when you withdraw your intercession and it allows Satan to come and just destroy a person's life. Now let me say this, I believe that this ought to be a last resort. 